you the quantum mechanics? Yes, we are the quantum mechanics with the paranormal podcast for the believers, the doubters and everyone in between. And Ben, it seems to be, I know we've we managed to sneak in the odd weather watch when we do the podcast. Mm, but Always. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's as if every time we record a thunderstorm just comes over. I don't know if that's paranormal or just our luck. Um, I like to think it's sort of the podcast gods giving us a little bit of encouragement. Yeah, I think so, hopefully. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, I, I, it's funny because I texted you this week and said, oh, I'm watching this kind of uh, American um, Senate thing on UFOs. Yes. <clears throat> and I thought, because it said it was a live stream, but I think what it was, it was a live stream of an old one rather than something new. I right, got very right. excited. But that aside, I was watching it and it had people from the Navy on talking about, you know, aerial phenomena and all that kind of stuff. And it was really interesting because I think it may have been from 2022, but I'm not sure. Um, They were asking them questions about, you know, encounters that have happened. And to be honest, I thought they were, the Navy guys were quite open um, about most of it. They were going to have another hearing, which was going to be behind closed doors. What I thought was incredibly interesting, given the episode we did a few weeks ago on underwater um, phenomena, unidentified underwater aquatic phenomena, um, when the guys were asked about that, they immediately closed it down and said, oh, we, we can only discuss that in the closed session. So I thought that was really interesting. It just made me wonder... The stuff we talked about before, you know, we're looking at the skies. Maybe we should be looking more under the waves. That is interesting. When you say they closed it down, did they just, um, they say, oh, we have to take that to a different hearing? Or yeah, something? they said we can't talk about that here, but we can co- we'll talk about it in the closed. Any question wow. about underwater UFOs. I wonder why. I mean, obviously everyone wonders why, but that is curious, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it's it's back to something we've discussed before. There's either one of two reasons. It's either, or three reasons really, it's either terrestrial secret technology that's either the Americans have or, or a foe that they don't want to talk about, or, you know, I guess you can leap to the conclusion it could be aliens. I'm not saying it's aliens. <laughs> but it's aliens. Yeah. I, I still think possibly breakaway civilization for the USO stuff. Yeah. Like we discussed before. Yeah, that's a really, it's an intriguing thought, that, isn't it? You know, and if it wasn't something mysterious like that, I'm not sure why they were so open to discussing aerial phenomenon, but, you know, weren't at all in discussing underwater phenomenon. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, We'll keep watching the waves, we'll keep watching the skies, and we'll keep watching YouTube, see if there's any other old Senate hearings that I've missed. <laughs> so weird. I do hope I find out in this lifetime. Yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? It would be. And the other story that really hit me this week was that the Mars rover has found signs of, uh, historical signs of potential organic material on Mars. I know they it's come across it before, but they found it in another kind of what looks like a dried up lake bed. So it doesn't definitively say that there was life on Mars, as David Bowie would say, but it's certainly more evidence that there could have been, which is fascinating. It is, but with all of these things, I tend to get really excited and then disappointed. But. Yeah, yeah. We could all be Martians, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a thought. Yeah. I wonder what my Martian name would be. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, I was going to go to sci-fi cliche, but let's not. No, Zorg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always Zorg. Yeah, it's always Zorg. <laughs> it's, the, it's the alien equivalent of Smith. Yeah. Um, this caught my mind. Uh, caught my mind. Caught my eye. This week, um, children possessed by murderous spirit after playing do- a demonic Panchito game are pinned down and exercised by terrified villagers. Wow. That from the mirror. Wow. Where, where was this? Five children from the same family reportedly became a- aggressive and possessed after playing the game in the town of Chachrasica, Na- Nicaragua. Wow. A young girl has claimed she heard voices telling her to cut off the heads of her family members. Mm-hmm. And again, they were playing this game, Panchito, Panchito. I don't know what that game is. No, I searched I was for ask it. You that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I could find 
Panchito, but Panchito, Panchito, it's some kind of childhood game. Um, right, so it's not like some kind of kind of Call of Duty or some demonic no. version of Call of Duty. But it's a basic. No. It sounds quite kind of innocent in in in, in name. It probably probably means something else like demonic possession. Yes, it's, it's the demonic possession <laughs> game. But it made me think. Um, we've done computers that kill, but yep. not computer games that kill uh, or damage. Yes, that's really interesting. Um, and that's what got me into it. And very quickly, I did know this. There's a game called Berserk. It's one of the earliest known examples of a possible link between a video game and an actual death. Mm. So at the time, in 1982, it was reported by news outlets that 18-year-old Peter Bukowski, there's always Bukowski as well, Yeah, landed uh, a few high scores on the, uh, on the Berserk arcade cabinet before collapsing from a heart attack he was later pronounced dead at the hospital although deputy coroner mark allen admitted stress from playing the game could have caused the attack he also noticed the presence the presence of scar tissue on bukowski's heart so it's possible that the game only helped to bring on something that had existed before right so he had an existing condition and the stress of playing the game basically exacerbated it and, and brought on a heart attack that led to his death. He was yes. 18, do you say? He was only 18. Wow. But that's the first recorded example. And then I realised there's a whole load more of this stuff. Um, listen to this and see if you remember this. An investigation's underway in Japan into why more than 600 children suffered from convulsions and vomiting after watching a television cartoon programme. It's thought that bright flashing lights in the cartoon, Pocket Monsters, were to blame. Andrew Burroughs reports. Almost every Japanese child knows Pocket Monsters and its star, Pakucho. They play the Nintendo computer game. They even sing the Pocket Monsters song. Pokemon! Millions were glued to the latest cartoon episode when a flashing explosion created from these slowed down images triggered convulsions in hundreds of children. Many were kept in hospital for over 24 hours. Often those affected had no history of epilepsy. More children had fits when excerpts were replayed on the news. Doctors said victims were shocked into a kind of hypnotic trance. Parents are alarmed. I always thought it was a cute program that was fine for kids. But now I have to be careful about everything they watch. It's not only cartoons, fits have been linked with computer games in isolated cases in Japan and Britain. One child in 200 in this age group of 5 to 20 is what's called photosensitive. Now that means that if a child is photosensitive, flashing lights at a certain rate, most commonly between 10 and 20 flashes per second, may precipitate an epileptic seizure. Eat this, watch this, Louis kick it. British television applies regulations to weed out dangerous flicker, typically caused by rapid contrasts, black on white, white on black. The BBC and the British television industry as a whole have actually known about this problem for a number of years, and we have detailed guidelines and give advice, technical advice, to programme makers so that they can avoid these problems when they're making programmes. And we obviously screen our programmes in advance, and I myself have viewed programmes, and we've taken shots out where we think there might be a danger of triggering photosensitive epilepsy. While television screens are carefully monitored, there's no system for regulating computer games. The Department of Trade and Industry concluded the number of people likely to be affected by flickering computer screens was too small to justify legislation. But the British Epilepsy Association is calling for computer games to carry warnings. Andrew Burrows, BBC News. So, so yeah, Ben, I, I, I guess the implication there is... So this is a TV show, not a game, but obviously Pokemon is a game as well. But, yeah. Um, I guess the implication is the the kind of flashing images and all that kind of stuff had had led to kind of in, an incident that um, an epileptic incident basically. Yeah, that's right. So that's sort of the first time that Pokemon has been co- accused of like causing some issues. I should say for our lawyers, Pokemon has better lawyers than us. None of this is ever proved. Yeah, but there was a lot over Pokemon Go as well, wasn't it? Of people you know, I don't, don't know, like getting run over or mugged in various areas where they're trying to capture Pokemon Go on the move. That's right, but before Pokemon Go, have a listen to this.
It's quite catchy, that, isn't it, Ben? <laughs> I quite like it. it it's very 8-bit. Yeah, very 8-bit. It, it does remind me of those really early P... C games like uh, what's the one I always used to play? Tapper. Do you remember that one? Tapper. No. I, I think it was called Tapper. It, it was the one where it was. I mean, if you saw it now, the graphics are probably disastrous. But it was a bartender who had about five or six bars, and he'd throw beers down the bar, and you had to go left or right and catch the beers oh, before they fell on the floor. Okay. And then obviously, he'd get faster and faster, and more beers would be flowing down these five or six bars. I mean, at the time, we thought it was the most amazing, graphically incredible thing with an amazing soundtrack like the one you've just heard, but uh, <laughs> not sure it would uh, stand up today. I love an 8-bit soundtrack, though. Yeah. So this story has two versions. One of them says that if you listen to the music of Lavender Town, you would die in reality. Right. Another says that 100 children were driven to suicide or had extensive suicidal tendencies from listening to it. Symptoms of nausea, nosebleed, anxiety, wow. ear infections and widespread anger uh, were all reported to be connected with Lavender Town. And this sort of became hyped up uh, via creepy pasta who did amplify right. uh, the story and turned it more into an urban legend. But Lavender Town itself was a very peculiar town in this uh, game of Pokemon. It was a place where dead Pokemon were buried, basically. Right. That's the story of it. So so is the implication... So rather than the actual sound or pitch or anything to do with the song, like an earworm type thing, it's more... It sounds a bit more mass hysteria-like. That's right, yeah. And there's various ideas that it might have had infrasound implanted into it. Ah, uh, that's interesting. But, of course, the little tiny speakers on the devices, and we're talking like Game Boy devices, they don't have the capacity to play out. Ultrasound. They can't do that no, frequency. Right. No. Right. Um, but it was uh, it was created by, uh, now I have been practising this, Janushi Masuda. Yeah, that's good. Sounds good. And he designed it to be high-pitched and annoying to go with the flow of the city theme right. that he was creating. So um, there's no suggestion that he tried to make this um, like dangerous or anything. <laughs> he, he didn't try and weaponize a soundtrack. No, no, not at all. But the pictures of um, Lavender Town are weird as well. It's colourless. It's got weird aesthetics. And um, if you um, if you die there, or if you lose a life there, um, a white hand appears on your shoulder mm. as the player of the game. Uh, you know, like in the game, not right, on your right, actual right. shoulder. It's a weird level. That's it's really a weird strange, level, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that kind of that mass hysteria element is fascinating, isn't it? That um, I guess as well. I don't know how long that section of the game is, but I, I guess you're hearing that tune on a loop for <laughs> for ages and ages right? for ages and ages, probably on headphones as well, because your parents have told you. Although it's weird, you 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 mentioned that because um, my daughter would revise for her exams listening because you can find it on youtube to the music from mario kart she said it really helped her concentrate is that right yeah especially the rain i think it's called rainbow road that one she really likes but yeah i'd be like i'd be walking past her room and they'd be like, oh my god what is she listening to she said, no it really helps me concentrate oh well maybe maybe the music does sort of um Maybe that's what it was designed for, because you're supposed to concentrate on playing the game. Yeah, well, you, I guess all music you have an emotional connection to, so so why not this kind of soundtrack? But may, maybe some uh, give you a different vibe than others, right? Well, yeah. I, I guess, it, you know, you wouldn't have music on movies and horror films if, if it didn't work. We... No, no, exactly, no. But it must be pointed out, like, um, again, I'm not scared of the lawyers, but... This game was <laughs> but in. I'm scared of the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> this game was in production for quite a long time and was in different markets. If there was any truth in it, I'm pretty sure it would have stopped shipping. So are there st so the stories of people being affected or, you know, worst case dying? Uh, you, you think most of those are creepy pasta or kind of internet rumours rather than any hard proof? Yeah, I mean the. Um, the the what's happened is the creepy pasta 
has picked up on it. So, for example, uh, one creepy pastor says that um, that composer uh, he'd put this track for this spooky town together, and the people at Pokemon didn't realise it contained all this hidden information because it didn't play out on the speakers of the devices. Yet, if you plug it into headphones it does oh, right. but that also doesn't make sense because the internal workings of the device also don't amplify those sounds into the headphones right so it's, it's very easy to refute yeah and just I, i'm sure our audience again just for legal clarity i'm sure our audience know what creepypasta is but if anyone doesn't it's it's basically a online mainly work of fiction that's created around a story um, but is passed off as something that is real. And often these stories spread and become kind of urban legends, but they're not based on true facts, even if the inspiration was something like this. That's right. I did find one games blogger who wrote a really interesting piece saying that um, this creepy pastor that came out in 2010, um, the Lavender Town Syndrome, um, they point out that it is confirmed to be a hoax. But they did say there are anecdotal stories of people who, if you listen to the Lavender uh, Town music long enough, give you it gives you a mild sense of dread. Right. And others, it's provoked panic attacks. Now, I think that's probably true of different sorts of music anyway. Well, uh, what it's reminded me of, Ben, is when we did uh, that episode on backmasking in music. It's making me think, you know, because we're a bit older than, uh, than most people. That, <laughs> <laughs> that, than Jesus. Yeah. I, I guess in, in our time, it was those kind of records that were supposed to, you know, turn you crazy or make you satanic or, you know, had backwards messaging, like Stairway to Heaven and all that kind of stuff. I guess this is the next generation's version of that. I think it is. And um, I think it's connected with... This idea of it's a secret world, you know, if someone's, if your kid is playing Pokemon with headphones on, it's sort of a secret world. And he, as you say, that sort of whole, um, you know, are your kids listening to Judas Priest upstairs in their bedroom? Yeah. It's the same sort of logistical thing for people getting worried about what it is those kids are watching or listening to. Well, I mean, we were brought up on those stories and listening to this music that was supposed to send us crazy and watching horror films on VHS that were supposed to make us obsessed with the dark and strangeness. And, you know, we turned out fine. It's not like we're presenting a paranormal podcast on these kind of stories now, is it? We don't do talk about this every Saturday morning. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> oh, God, there is something in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this blogger goes on to say... Although that they have experienced this with other people from Lavender Town Syndrome, and they themselves do sometimes get crippling anxiety from it, they also themselves point out it's no laughing matter, but they do suffer from crippling mental anxiety anyway. Right. And there are other scenarios that bring this on that they have, you know, that they have witnessed. So they said their sort of take on the whole thing is. Um, yeah, some computer games can bring this on, some music can bring this on. But um, very interesting set of blogs and stories around there. And I quite like this idea of building upon uh, the world of, um, you know, that po Pokemon has these hidden messages. I love the idea of hidden mm. messages anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, you know, even if they're just little Easter eggs or kind of flashbacks to things, definitely. Yeah. Um, and the mass, the mass hysteria angle of it fascinates me. I, mean, I know we talk about it a lot on the podcast, but I am quite obsessed with how something can take hold which affects multiple people who are not even connected. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we're, there will always be tales, tales like that. But, um, yeah, check out Lav Lavender Town Syndrome. And um, if you did enjoy the music in um, uh, in this episode, you can find loads of people have posted it on <laughs> YouTube if you want to remix it. Just don't listen to it over and over again. Now, in 1981, an arcade in the Portland, Oregon area was the scene of countless ga gamers 
coming down with migraines, 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 heart attacks, though nobody died. Right. Addiction, seizures, strokes, and even amnesia. Wow. All down to one game cabinet. <laughs> Polybius. Polybius. Oh, I've never have heard Have you of heard of Polybius? No, what is Polybius? The game itself was thought to have been created, or was said to have been, created by an unknown government agency to test mind control technology uh, on unsuspecting civilians. Wow. It worked almost too well. Or so the legend goes. Right. And do we have an idea of what the game is? Because, again, in terms of creating a addictive, compelling game that captures the imagination of the teenage community, I'm not sure the government's the best place for creating that kind of thing, but it sounds, if the story's true, they have. Well, we'll come on to it and what it looks like. It was even being drawn in The Simpsons. It's this famous. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it might seem quaint to discuss something like this now because we've got Facebook, um, military recruiting via Twitch, deep fakes, all of that. But this is a more naive time. And again, this is another urban legend that may have had some truth in, in something of what it says. The original Polybius was an ancient Greek philosopher who was born in 2008 <laughs> BC in Megalopolis, Arcadia. See what they did there? Oh, Arcadia. Oh, I know. Nice. Um, and he's known for his affinity for cryptozoo- uh, cryptozoological <laughs> cryptography and puzzles. Again, that does sound very government-like. You know, they say, we've got to create a game that's really going to appeal to the teenagers. <laughs> Let's go back to Greek mythology. <laughs> <laughs> well, Polybius itself means many lives in Greek. Right. Many lives, Arcadia, cryptic puzzles too good a name for a spooky video game right right the urban legend of polybius gained popularity in february 6 2000 when listing for the game popped up on coinop.org a digital museum and database for arcade gaming oh that sounds like fun <laughs> the page for polybius listed the game as having been copyrighted in 1981 although such no, no such copyright exists and only briefly mentions bizarre rumours about the title before classifying its history as unknown. Mm. And it, uh, so, and do we do they describe what you have to do in the game? What kind of what kind of game is it? Do we know? Uh, well, so let me let me tell you about who the creator is supposed to be. Okay, and that might tell you about what the game might look like. Right. Um. Although it's impossible to confirm, of course, the person believed to have created the, the post uh, there on Coinop is a guy called Kurt Collar, the owner of the site. Collar would also tip off writer Dan Electro. What a great name. They've all got good names, haven't they? Kurt I, Collar, I, Dan Electro. I think they might be Suze of GamePro, yeah. which at the time claimed to be the world's largest independent multi-platform gaming magazine, uh, to the existence of the story. Eventually, in a 2003 listicle called Secrets and Lies, GamePro came to the inconclusive verdict rego uh, regarding the veracity of the tip. The story went on to hit Slashdot, uh, the closest thing to going viral in the noughties, on uh, tw August 21st, 2003. So this is where we start getting spread around what this, um, this government, uh, the fact that it was the government who were coming up with it. Right. And because of all of that publicity, uh, it went on to be the subject of TV shows, music videos, documentaries, and an episode of The Simpsons, as I say, and became a real purchasable game more than once. Oh, so what people jumped on, whether it was true or not, yes. people jumped on the back of it and created something, passing it off as the real thing or as a, in tribute? Probably so, a bit of both. So maybe. somebody has passed it off as the real thing once. Right. But it's really, it's like a shapes game is what it is. Okay. So it's not particularly, it's not a shoot 'em up or anything. Yeah. Can you imagine it's, pitching that now? It's a shapes game based on Greek mythology. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, they're gonna, the, the youth are going to lap that up. Um, <laughs> I like the idea. I don't know if this is the background to it, but in my mind I have this vision that it's one console unit in an arcade and that's the only one. I love that concept, that it's this kind of 
you could see a film around that, couldn't you? It's a weird addictive game that has been created by the government for whatever reason, but it's only available in one arcade and it's the only one that exists. That's that's quite that's a compelling idea, isn't it? It is, it is. And there is a reason why people thought this about the arcade, and um I will come on to it. But the the fascinating thing about this is that around these posts where people were posting about the game itself, somebody comes on and says that they were involved in the game, in programming the original arcade machine. Right, the development of it. And uh, their post, uh, to summarise it, it says, um, Marek Vachusek was the programmer who came up with the name Polybius. He'd studied Greek mythology at uh, Maysark University and came up with the name because he thought it sounded bold and mysterious, yeah. which is what we wanted. The inspired graphics combined with the puzzle elements and scintillating gameplay was something to behold. We play-tested it for hours and hours, and it certainly was an addictive game, and it was well-loved professionally and recreationally by all that played it. Right. When we received a phone call stating that there were concerns within the company that the basic graphics, which featured prominently in so many other games at the time, were fine for the average gamer to spend hours at a time without any noticeable physical or mental detriment, but the intense engrossing gameplay of this new step was very much an unknown quantity. So the game was put back several months due to divided opinion within the board of directors, much to our consternation, for breaking our backs to finish it on time. So they're basically saying they accidentally invented something that was too addictive. Right, right. And that came out in testing and it kind of caused a bit of a furore within the company of... Yes, right. yes. So they go on to explain that that is when the government gets involved and they start wanting to see whether this accidentally invented gameplay could be used for nefarious purposes. For kind of mind control or, yeah, whatever, I guess. Yeah, so um, mind control, um, almost like... Um, it's been described as, like, could you use it to almost put a curse on someone to right. mess with them? Right, right. I'm just, I'm just thinking about the kind of <laughs> the potential military use at that time. What we'll do is we'll create hundreds of these arcade machines and drop them on the enemy. <laughs> 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 They'll be so addicted they won't want to fight. <laughs> well, I just got this vision of the, the, this huge game machine coming down on a para, on a parachute in the middle of a war zone. <laughs> God, we put the wrong plug on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's not about. Well, the American military did experiment with doing that with porn in the Vietnam War. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and uh, I remember when we did the uh, interruption episode, and Tommy Trelawney was talking about them playing those kind of spooky ghost sounds in the Vietnam War to um, to put off the enemy and scare them. So yeah, no, it's, it's not, there. There have been weird idea, weirder ideas, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So on on Polybius, the other fascinating thing that comes up is some sources claim that the story of Polybius was making the rounds on Usenet as early as 1994, although there is yet again no record of this existing. Um, and some people have said that's the Mandela effect. <laughs> oh, cool, we get the all wet. Okay. Which would make sense, wouldn't it, in terms of this big game that nobody can remember? Is that what is that where the implication comes? Well, in? yes, but there's a Pink Floyd themed puzzle which was going around Usenet in the, in the early nineties called Publius Enigma, wow. which became so popular that its name was inexplicably displayed by during one of the band's concerts. Oh, uh, what? Uh, what in, in, in their kind of graphics? Yeah, or what? yeah. Wow. Apparently, the puzzle is near incomprehensible and has never been solved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds very Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's kind of it's all we know so far is it was possibly generated from internet rumor, or maybe it had its roots in something else. Right. Because the FBI was conducting top secret operations out of America's arcades. Really? The Bureau's records indicate that the agency actually was monitoring and subsequently raiding arcades in the Portland area right around the time that the stories of players collapsing in arcades had hit the mainstream media. 
Um, and this, the, I'm taking this, there's um, a great summary of it that um, we'll post a link to the author. Um, in those days, he says, arcades, which are naturally dark and maze-like, had seedy reputations as hotbeds of gambling, drug activity and pickpockets. Right. And yeah, the FBI were raiding them to try and see if they could um, break drug deals and things like that. Well, if they were a hotbed of drug activity, that might explain some premature heart attacks as well. Well, quite, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there could be a cause and effect here rather than the game itself, right? The, the other thing that the FBI did, they rigged cabinets with cameras and microphones to catch criminals at the, uh, uh, in the act. Right. And there were three or four games that they specifically targeted because the cabinets featured glass bezels so they were ideal for putting cameras behind. Right. Tempest was the game that they were most often um, using. So it was nothing to do with the actual gameplay. It was more to do with the construction of the unit than by the sounds of it. Yeah. Right. Well, this author goes on to say, the programme was so extensive that it briefly caused a shortage of Tempest machines <laughs> in the Seattle area during the 80s. So I'm assuming the creators of the machines knew nothing about this because that'd be terrible PR for them. No, they didn't. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah. And if you see men in black wheeling Tempest machines in and out of arcade every few days, it only makes sense that people would start making stories up about it, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does, really does. And yes, that kind of... And, and as with all things where... These kind of games are new and, you know, I guess you can go back of war games and all those movies from the from the 80s. You know, there was, you can see why people were jumping on that hysteria and paranoia, a bit like everyone saying there's going to be a raft of AI type movies over the next couple of years because it's it's salient at the moment, right? Uh, it is, yeah, yeah. And there, there was a point in the eighties where that was the same with video games. I mean, because I, I was, I remember I was when I was working in the in, the music industry, there was a whole thing about how it's going to completely destroy music and all this kind of stuff, and nobody will be listening to music anymore. Which you know, it doesn't work out that way. But there was a lot of paranoia at, at, on all kinds of levels let alone kind of health and well-being and welfare. Some of it probably proved to be true, but yeah. Well, as w what usually happens, you've hit the nail <laughs> on the head, as you will see right. why that's funny, because the latest and most easily obtained version of Polybius is released by Llamasoft for the PS4 in 2016 and is used for the music video of Less Than by Nine Inch Nails, right. released in 2017. Oh, okay. Oh, I've not seen that video. I'll have to look that up. I know I didn't know that. That's amazing. So it's really got kind of cult status, whether it's true or not. Oh yeah. So, yeah. so in that sense, we're talking about Pink Floyd. We're talking about Nine Inch Nails. You know, let alone all the the internet rumours and other things. It's, yeah, it's really some whether it's true or not. Something about the story has really taken hold in popular culture. Oh yeah, yeah. I think. Um... It, it's well. It's obviously got a life of its own, and you start mixing in Usenet and Nine Inch Nails and um, Pink Floyd, and you've got yourself a proper tale. Wow! But it's not the weirdest thing to happen in computing. <laughs> really? There is something There's weirder. More. <laughs> there is something weirder. Right. The weirdest one is how people feared, very specifically, Japan's trade ministry feared that. Um, the PlayStation 2 would fall into the wrong hands. Well, I, I know they're difficult. They would, PlayStations are always difficult to get a hold of when they come out, but that's really... That's well, they extreme. were thinking Saddam Hussein. Really? Right. So okay, uh, this, that's a good intro. <laughs> <laughs> so it was set up, the, the PS2 set up as a superior piece of hardware, right? Yeah. It's got that new Emotion Engine CPU, um, basically pushing polygons for 3D gaming, as this author puts it. And the company's initial tech demo was they um, reanimated a scene from Final Fantasy VIII, demonstrated detail uh, unlike anyone had seen in the year 2000. I think I've still got a PS2 somewhere. So <laughs> Sony were told if they wanted to ship the PS2 abroad, they would need a special permit. Because, as the law is written... It required any exporter who wished to ship hardware 
with potential military applications worth more than $472 outside the country to get permission from the government. So they did get the permit, but some countries were blacklisted. Libya, Iran, Iraq, North Korea. They couldn't get it. Uh, Obviously, the US did. But what were the potential military applications? And it all came down to this emotion engine and its ability to process three-dimensional images. The pair, the chip has a pair of vector processing units that in normal use allow the system to calculate positions in physical space. That functionality could be used, for example, as part of a missile guidance system. OK, let me give a head round this. So, But all that would tell you is the collection of people who had PlayStations and where they were, or is it wider than that, or am I just not misunderstanding? Well, no, so wh- where it goes to is um, in Sept- sorry, in December 2000, it was reported that 4,000 PS2s had been bought by Saddam Hussein, who intended to connect them together to pilot unmanned drones. Wow. Intelligence agencies denied that uh, there were any nefarious aims with Iraq, but they were worried, and they were particularly worried about what happened if you strung them all together. Maybe Saddam Hussein was just a good, big Gran Turismo fan. (laughs) You can't blame him. (laughs) Well, you see, what happened was, to test this, this theory out, the National Centre for Supercomputing Applications, <laughs> who knew they were a thing, yeah. saw the cost-to-performance ratio of the console was really good. So they networked 70 PS2s together, built a library to perform various tasks with it, and fired it up. And it worked really rather well. The only trouble was you had to keep rebooting it. But <laughs> they had invented basically a Frankenstein supercomputer from PS2s. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing how, I mean, if you think, so has has this fear gone away because of technology and encryption and all that? Because, you know, certainly PS4s and consoles now are, uh, and the internet itself are so powerful. Is it just, is it a risk that we are living with now or have they come up with solutions? Because surely the risk has just been got worse, surely. It's a risk we're living with. Right. Yeah. Um, The Air Force created the 33rd most powerful supercomputer on Earth using 1,760 PS3s in 2010. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, Wow. That's incredible, isn't it, where you have these developments. And they do say that, don't they? It's reminded me a little bit of all those inventions like Velcro and stuff like that that came out of the space race that have changed our lives in ways that people didn't really expect at the time this this almost seems like the other way around you know yeah something yeah. that's created for purely entertainment purposes that is really repurposable as 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 something you know more more sinister maybe well um part of it is just this cost because they're so much cheaper mm. than if you buy the hardware independently um The Department of Defence said it's up to 10 times cheaper to get your technology from a PlayStation 3. (laughs) I just had this vision of some remote soldier getting mixed up with Call of Duty and the real thing. (laughs) I'm just having a play around. No, you're on the live one. You just just wiped out half of Canada. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's not the end of the story because I'll leave you with this, which is particularly pertinent with what's been in the news recently. In 2014, uh, the US uh, Navy showed off the High Energy Laser Mobile Demonstrator. Um, (laughs) The HELMD. they got to work on that name. We Um, often say when they were in the meeting, somebody's going, oh, that's great, that's really good, yeah. It fires a focus beam of protons at airborne targets like drones to make them blow up. Their control device for this... An Xbox 360 controller. An Xbox 360 drives the (laughs) H-E-L-M-D. In a way, there is, apart from the technology aspect, it does kind of make sense because that 
computer controllers kind of work more or less in the same way, don't they? So there's been lots of development over the years of kind of ease of use and what buttons work. You know, it's almost like a language, isn't it? So you could understand why they go, well, we'll use the same language as controllers and then you go well why don't we just use the controller itself that it is there is a certain logic to it there is a certain logic to it yes yes um and i think if it went into production they would build their own proper one yeah but um it's sort of when you say has the threat gone away no no not really right like the russian army can just get some ps5s and you know they could probably control some drones. Well, that that was um, that was part of the 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 recent disaster, wasn't it, with the submarine going to the Titanic? Yeah, yeah. Because that was part. I think it was a peer, Was it a? I think it was a PlayStation controller. I think it that was too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So that's you know. I remember seeing that on the news and going, "That's so bizarre." But it's obviously not that bizarre now. We think about it. Yeah. So computer games that kill in various different ways. Oh, we've just we've we've succeeded in turning something kind of pleasurable and innocent, and that there is a dark side to it. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. That is amazing, and I I think out of all the stories, I love that idea of the arcade game that may may not have existed that has taken on a life of its own. Yeah. That's incredible, incredible. <laughs> I would. Um... I would uh, get everyone to watch Stuart Ashen's um, The Polybius Heist. I love Stuart Ashen's. He's my favourite YouTuber. Right. And he's made a film about it, a comedy film, uh, and it's well worth watching. Okay. Well, definitely check that out. Um, and also check us out on YouTube if you don't get us from your normal pod providers. We are up there now publishing our podcast. So if you go to YouTube and go to The Quantum Mechanics, you can find us there. Um, I, I, is it worth quick uh, Sherlock Holmes mention? Because I've had a little one, nothing major, nothing major. I was uh, I was having a little think about Sherlock when I was reading this week's online edition of Pop Bitch, and uh, there was quite a good story on Sherlock related story on Pop Bitch, and I don't remember coming across one before, but it it was about. Um, it's quite funny. It's, it's worth a read. It's it's uh, it will still be up there either this week or last week's edition or email about uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and other people from Sherlock Holmes doing a kind of I think it was a fan thing or or a press thing, and they were asked to read out erotic fan fiction based on Sherlock Holmes. Oh my god! And apparently they. They did it, but they weren't particularly uh, enamoured with it and it didn't go down particularly well. So, uh, yeah, I think they came away from it thinking, why were we asked to do that? But, yes, they were. They were. I, my Sherlock experience this week is uh, coming across a story about uh, Benedict Cumberbatch reading erotic fan fiction based on <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. So if you are still uh, partaking in the TQM Tulpa Project, uh, maybe producing your own erotic uh, fiction and might actually create a tulpa for you. Who knows? That, I can't think of anything worse, to be honest. No, no, nor me, nor me. Um, He's just got his hat on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is a right old deer stalker, that one. Oh, Lord. Um, uh, well, that was amazing, Ben. Thank you. I loved I loved those kind of stories. Yeah, we. It's, if you like this episode, it's worth... Uh, checking out the one we did on Gremlins, and uh, I think it was our Gremlins Two, wasn't it? Where we did about computers, the CPM batch. Yeah, the CPM batch. Go check that one out as well, because if you like these stories, there were some similar ones there. Um, Patreon. Uh, we'll do a little uh, mention of Patreon if you want to become a Quantum Mechanics Patreon and help us to buy books, equipment, go on field trips. If you go to patreon.com forward slash TQM pod, you can support us there. We're starting now to add uh, some exclusive and upfront content. So uh, it's, it's definitely worth checking out if you want to 
find out a little bit about what we're doing behind the scenes and get some exclusive and early content it's a, a good place to get it and you'll be helping us and helping us support make the podcast better so thank you all those who've already done it and those who are thinking about doing it, take the jump uh, so patreon.com forward slash tqm pod yeah uh we'd all really appreciate that it's um uh running these podcasts it's a it's a big old it's a big old thing but um just like to say thank you to everybody that uh contributed to everything that i've covered today there's too many names to mention but um if you wrote about uh any of those things i probably read your article um and downloaded bits of your book so um everyone that's interested in that thank you and um Stuart Ashen's uh, channel for getting me onto Polybius. Lovely. All right. Well, we'll be uh, we'll be back next week with more quantum mechanics weirdness. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, we look forward to you coming back next week. Take care. See you then. See you then. Bye. the quantum mechanics.